Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Maria Ledigans, and I am from Music TT, and I'm really excited to be speaking with you today on sponsorship and carrying on the theme of Global Entrepreneurship Week, where we're focusing on the steel band industry. I'm hoping that my experience in sponsorship will be able to translate to your needs in the industry. And I'm also really excited to announce that Mr. Colin Greaves, who is actually the manager for BP Renegades, will also be joining me shortly. And he is going to be telling you all about the sponsorship perspective of BP Renegades. So let's get started. So who am I? Okay, so I have worked in business development and sponsorship for most of my working career. So far, I have worked for NGOs, the ministry. I've worked at the National University, UTT, and I'm now with a state company. So I have worked on the end of trying to get sponsorship and also giving sponsorship. So I hope that you learned some lessons from me. Or oh, if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask at the end of my presentation. So I'm not an artist, but I'm really passionate about the creative industry. And as a Trinidadian, who does not love the national instruments? So what is sponsorship? We have these generic terms, and I think a lot of people tend to mix up sponsorship with charitable grants and giving. So for the sake of clarity, sponsorship is the act of supporting an event, activity, person, or organization financially or through the provisions of products and services. So you have to bear in mind upfront that sponsorship is not just about getting money. And then what we are gonna be focusing on more today is actually corporate sponsorship. And the key thing to remember with corporate sponsorship is that corporate sponsorship is actually a tool, it's a marketing tool that is used to actually raise brand identity and visibility of the sponsor. Right. Um, so corporate sponsors often characterize their sponsorship activities and their benefits as doing well by doing good. The reason being is sponsorship often falls under corporate social responsibility, which means that if an organization is in a certain community, they want that community to do well. They want that community to appreciate having that particular company amongst them. So when the community does well and the community thrives, where the corporation is operating in, it's a win-win situation for both. So we have to just remember that the common way for how corporate sponsorships work is that it usually involves a collaboration between a nonprofit organization, such as a steel band, and a sponsor corporation in which the company funds a project or program managed by the nonprofit in exchange for brand recognition and community visibility. You see this idea of brand recognition being tied into corporate sponsorship is key to understanding how this is gonna roll up. So corporations may have their logos and brand names displayed alongside of the organization undertaking the project or the program. So we have seen that for years. When we go to the pan yards, we see the corporate sponsors listed prominently and any sorts of photo ops, in fact, What's happening now is like in terms of BP Renegades, BP is coming before the actual steel band. So it is not the same as philanthropy, which involves donations um, to causes that serve the public good that may not yield any return branding or otherwise to the donor. And it is not a grant, which, and what a grant is, is basically a non-repayable fund or products disbursed given by one party, which is grant makers, and they often come from the government. So how grants usually work is that if I'm the one giving a grant, I will put out a call for applications where you then have to develop your grant proposal. And usually it's very, very specific on how this grant money has to be used. And it's a very set timeline and you have to have a very high level of compliance and reporting involved in it, okay? So this is an example of how the corporation's logo is integrated into the steel band marketing. So as you can see, we have shell invaders up on the slide. So what does the association with some of the country's premier steel bands bring to companies that serve as their title sponsors? 
So you have to remember that there is a reason why these companies want to sponsor steel bands. And one of them is a title sponsorship of a premier steel band allows companies to associate with this country's national instrument. Remember, the steel band is a source of pride to us Trinidadians. Steel band is an instrument that is known the world over. We all know how much the Japanese and Chinese countries um, are in love with our steel band. And we take pride in that. So sponsoring a steel band allows a company to get a great deal of mileage for significant parts of the year. And that is not only at carnival time, as most steel bands have concerts throughout the year and during the steel band festivals. Sponsorship also extends to the brand of the company internationally when steel bands undertake international tours or when steel bands play locally at international conferences. So we can't just keep thinking of Panorama. I mean, we know that our steel bands do tours internationally. We raise visibility for the company that is the band's sponsor. So again, it is a win-win, you know, association. Because an association with a premier steel band may serve to enhance the goodwill status and appeal of the sponsoring company. All right. So for me, the key is if I had a steel band or if I was a panist, you have to remember up front, even though you're not a profit organization, you can still generate revenue that you then feed back into the operating costs of your steel band. So you always have to remember at the end of the day, yes, you're a musical group. Yes, you are like a family. Yes, you've been doing this for years. Yes, you're an artist, but you are a business. All right. And that is really critical. And if you are a business, you have to figure out what is your USP? Because remember, this is entrepreneurship, Global Entrepreneurship Week. And your USP is your unique selling point. What makes you different from the other steel bands out there? Is it because you have a better arranger? Is it because your band is more organized? Is it that you can mobilize quicker? What makes you different? What makes you stand out from the rest of the other bands that are going to be seeking sponsorship? So you have to figure out what is your brand? What do you represent in your community? What do you stand for? Are you tied to a particular cause? Are you big on drawing attention to the environment? Are you big on drawing attention to literacy? So you need to develop your brand identity. Now, another key thing is you just can't say, I'm going out and I'm looking for sponsorship. You have to identify companies that align with your brand. So remember, I was giving you examples of are you passionate about the environment as a steel band? Are you passionate about literacy? What other companies are operating in our sphere that has values that align with yours that you could approach them for sponsorship? So it's really important that you have this brand alignment. I'm going to give you a story. So when I was in high school, I went to Maple Leaf. I was doing public relations on our student government. And part of the things we had to do was help organize events. So there's this Canadian charity run that's called Terry Fox. And it's an international event where we do these Terry Fox runs to raise revenue, to draw attention to cancer research and cancer awareness. And of course, you have to wear red. That is the color of the marathon. I'm so busy organizing this, organizing that, making sure everyone has a right to get to the Savannah. Day of the event dawns. I'm like, shoot, I didn't even think about what I'm going to wear. And I'm like, well, I need a red T-shirt. We're going around the Savannah. I grab the first red T-shirt I can find. And it is only when I'm almost down to the Savannah that I look down and I see I have a Dumore logo. And I don't think aligning cigarettes <clears throat> with a cancer awareness walk was the best match in terms of a brand identity. So please, let's not repeat that mistake. Now, key to this is you've identified your unique selling points. You know what your brand is standing for. You found a company that aligns with your brand. You have to know what is it you really need from your sponsor. And I mean, guys, we're operating in a COVID-19 environment. Funding is restriction, like restricted, sorry. Sponsorship is down. You cannot ask for the sun, the moon, and the stars. Is it transport that you are looking for, like logistical assistance with that? Is it that you need refurbishments of your panyard? Is it that you need sponsorship to help pay your range on a regular basis? You have to be very specific in your ask. And when you're making your ask, you also have to tell them, this is your budget. You can't just say, 
Dear sponsor, I'm a so-and-so steel barn hailing out of so-and-so community and I require $60,000. Sincerely, yours. You have to actually tell them what your ask is and show them how you plan on using this money. And that's not the only part. You have to have the most important part is what can you offer your potential sponsor? Is it that whenever you are having your events, you're also streaming lives, you have hundreds of people that are watching you so their brand can gain visibility? Is it that you're willing to pre um, perform at their corporate events on a drop of a hat? What is it that you can offer your potential sponsor? Because I remember, this is not a charitable gift. This is a relationship between you and your sponsor. And it can't just be one hand clap in all the time. So this is something that you really need to think about. So I just want to touch briefly on the National Registry of Artists and Cultural Workers. I'm sure most of you all have heard about the Artist Registry. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is that when you have registered on this registry, it already lets potential sponsors know that you are a professional entity, whether you're steel bound or a panis, because there is a level of pre-screening that goes through this. So this means that you're not just some person who rolls out her bed and say, I'm a panis, or me and a couple of partners, we have a steel bound. This shows that you all have worked in the industry, that you all are really striving to develop your craft because one of the benefits of also being on the artist registry is that they have a mentoring with the master's program where you can access classes, mentorship, and you can do a form of upskilling. And also, if you want to get visas to travel, the U.S. Embassy actually, I believe, requests that you are registered on the artist registry. So I'm going to talk a little bit of the live music district, and this is where Music TT actually provides a form of sponsorship to the venues in Port of Spain by subsidizing the cost of you coming out to perform. It is to encourage the creation of a live music district in Trinidad. So, I mean, we are in COVID-19 reality, so it's not operating as how we would like it to just yet in terms of the physical venues, but we have been doing online streaming and concerts. And if you do come They're asking me to join. Am I back on? Okay. Hi, apologies for that. Um, technical issues on our side. Our internet seems to love to drop in the middle of our GEW presentations. Um, so as I was saying, um, if you can come to Music TT's website, visit our website and register for the Live Music District, I've listed what the um, price range is. So we would pay $1,000 if you're a solo pan panist, a duet or a trio. If you're a person, you can get $2,000. And if you're a large band of six or more, it's $2,500. And of this is that when you start to perform for different restaurant owners or the different hoteliers they like it you draw a crowd you don't know who's listening to you perform they may come and they would hire you then for subsequent work which is what has happened for a number of our artists and yes i'm so sorry my presentation slides are a little bit stuck right so key thing is a sponsorship proposal now as i have said i have written sponsorship proposals and i've also been privy to quite a few and i know that what i have on the slide we seen basic but sometimes we have to get back to basics so the first thing is keep it simple no one wants to sit down and read a 25 page proposal if they have never met you never had a conversation with you so i would always say let your sponsorship proposal be no more than two to three pages for the most because what it is, they're not going to just cut you a check from reading your proposal. They're going to invite you to come in and meet with them in person to then discuss a potential sponsorship arrangement in detail. 
So the first thing you have to do is who are you? Tell me about your steel band or yourself as a panist. Where are you coming from? How many years are you in operation for? Again, this is where you discuss your brand, right? This is where you discuss how much streams you have, you know, the kind of audience building that you have. And then you have to then come down to what is your ask? What exactly is it that you're asking for? Remember, be as specific as possible. Please do not send a sponsorship proposal where you're vague, where you're looking for support. What kind of support? Financial support? How much? What are you going to do with this money? You don't want financial support. You want actually access to education. What exactly? Is it like a course? Is it a degree for your angel? What is it that you're looking for? And again, what's in it for your sponsor? Remember, I told you, you have to look for companies that would align with your brand. So you have to show where you all are matching up in values, how you could benefit them. So it's not just them benefiting you. And please, please, please put reachable contact information because we have gotten proposals where you have a lovely telephone number, but the telephone number is no longer in service. I am not a mind reader. I don't know that I have to WhatsApp call you only when you have data available. Or this is your email address, but it's really your aunt's email address who checks it maybe once every three months. So whatever you do, make sure that your contact information is up to date and it is always checked and is always on call because you really don't want to miss that phone call or that email. All right. So the do nots of sponsorship, please do not send generically titled letters because you would have done your research. You know this company lines up with your brand. You pick up your phone. You don't know anybody in there, but there's a receptionist. And a receptionist can tell you the name of the person that you want to direct your letter to and their email address. Don't say to whom it may concern. Turnout is too small for that. And if you don't know, you can find somebody who knows who's working in a company to then tell you the proper title and the name of the person you want to get in touch with. And again, you don't want to give your life story to the person. We have received some bios that I think should be a novel or maybe options to Netflix, right? I don't need to know how you're born. I don't need to know that the chicken was your best friend when you were three years old. I just need to know about your steel ban and how you're operating. Okay. I have also seen where my GM has received a WhatsApp sponsorship proposal. That's not going to work. You have to keep your, you know, at first, you don't know these people. You have to send them an email or a physical letter. Email is usually preferable. Do not WhatsApp these people. You don't know if they check their WhatsApp. It's just not a professional way to communicate. And let's not be unprofessional in your engagements. From the time you get a sponsor or a sponsor's considering you, make sure that whatever it is that you all are promising that you deliver on. If they said, okay, well, let's see how this goes, but we really need you guys to come out and, you know, perform at one of our corporate events. Show up on time. Show up with, you know, appropriate clothing. Event coordinators there. You don't go and say, hey, I reach where you want, mom. It's like, hi, good morning, we are here. Don't show up after your sound check. You know that sound checks are very important and it is a very lengthy process at times because you don't want that you show up after your sound check, the potential sponsors trying to see how you, you're going. And you know what? Your music is distorted. So you want to try and be as professional as possible. And as our, as our mothers used to tell us, do not forget your manners at home. So let's say they decide to start off your sponsorship small because you remember you're building this relationship. You don't want to forget to say thank you and follow up, send them a nice note on how much it means to you and everything like that. And you know why? Because this is not a one and done deal. If you get sponsored for one thing and you think you could build this relationship, that is what you want to do because Colin is going to come and tell you that BP has been sponsoring the Renegades for 50 years. So that is far from a one and done. That is longer than most marriages today. And the sponsorship pitfalls. So again, I'm going to say, let us not be unrealistic in your ask. We are operating in a global pandemic. If you see a company, for example, sending home hundreds of employees, it may not be realistic to expect to get $5 million for one year. You know, let's break down and see what is really needed and go from there. Maybe the pioneer needs, you know, painting. 
maybe it needs a facility washroom upgrading. You know, let's let's think about it and let's be realistic. Now, the sponsorship may lead to a dependency and stagnate your entrepreneurial drive. So again, keeping in mind that this is Global Entrepreneurship Week, we have to remember, like, we want sponsorship to be sustainable because you're a business. You are not operating as a business if you are just relying on sponsorship to get you through without you growing and innovating in your revenue streams. Yes, you are not for profit, but you can still generate revenue to help offset your costs. So this is what happens when you become very dependent and sponsorship becomes like a double-edged sword. Remember when Patreon shut down? 15 steel bands abruptly lost their sponsorship when that happened. So according to Lisa Burkett, who is the manager for Corpcom for NGC, they had invested $9 million in sponsoring steel bonds over the period 2012 to 2018. She didn't disclose how much money they spent in 2019, but the budgets were reduced. And she said for NGC, even though our ability to sponsor has dramatically decreased, we have increased value for the bonds by focusing on sustainability. Bond sustainability may occur with NGC cause a financial head start. For example, the library Knights and Gales got financial support to purchase a truck, which it uses for transportation, and it is the nucleus of a transportation business. The Coover Joylanders were given financing for the construction of a theatre from which it earns a rental income, and an MOU between the parties guides the use of money, which may require bands to run programs in music literacy, pan tuning, and manufacturing. So again, every relationship between the sponsor and the sponsored band is different. You all have to come to terms of agreement on what you all are going to work towards. All right, so what is your sponsorship cheat sheet before we call in, call in? You have to know your network is your net worth. And I mean, we are tired of hearing this phrase, but it is so true. So I'll give you an example. When I was working on UTT, um, how our staff operated is depending on a project within our department, the different units will shuffle around. So at this particular time, this is when um, the Pakistani Nobel Prize winner, Malalo, who is a huge education activist, came to Trinidad on a state visit. And we had to help coordinate that and secure sponsorship to offset the costs. So my role really was to you know, help keep a track of the budget. And I saw you know, everyone trying to contact these companies for sponsorship. And I started to think, I was like, mm, I wonder if I could help them out. And I was like, wait, well, my sister-in-law, she works for Rethink, and she was a coordinator for a project called Project Happiness, which has to do with education and tweaking children's curriculum and learning. So I was like, hey, um, Manda, how are you doing today? And she's like, hey, I'm fine, what's up? I was like, I'm girl, I'm working on sponsorships for Malala's state visit. You know, she's coming to turn that. And she's like, really? She called me back within the hour. She mentioned it to her boss, and her boss sent to UTT that same afternoon a check for $100,000, sponsored a lunch for Malala. But again, this is not charity. This was sponsorship on the condition that his staff at Rethink can meet with Malala in person at the Hilton Hotel and receive signed copies of her book. So if I never texted my sister-in-law to tell her what I was doing, that never would have happened. So again, you have to think about who you may not know, but who your friends or your family or your work colleagues may know. And it's like a chain, you keep going through it. It's kind of like when you're in a group lime on a beach and you see somebody you really like that you were introduced to, all of a sudden you know how to ask who are they, who is their people, what he or she does for a living. It's that same kind of passion you have to put you know, behind securing your sponsorship. Because remember, it's a relationship you're trying to get and work on. And you should never be afraid to ask for critical feedback. You may think your band or yourself as a panist is the best thing that's happened in the steel plant community in decades. But it's good to get a reality check. They may say y'all are amazing, but you'll need to work on this because everybody has room for improvements. And again, let's just be really realistic when you ask because if you send in a proposal that is just unrealistically high in your ask, they're not even gonna bother to contact you. But if you come in at a low to middle level us, you may say, okay, let's have a discussion on this. Let's meet with them. And again, 
you always have to have an offering on the table for your sponsor. What is your value you are bringing to the table? Why they should choose to sponsor you and not sponsor another steel van? And just remember, don't sell yourself short. Just because things are tight in the industry does not mean that it's impossible. And if you don't invest in yourself, then who will? So I'm going to invite Colin to log in and join me now. As you can tell, Colin is the head of public relations at Digicel, and he is also the president of BP Renegades. And he definitely can host a masterclass on sponsorship and grant giving. So we will wait two minutes for him to join us. Does anybody have any questions in the meantime while we wait on him? Hi, Colin. Hi, hi. Hi, Colin. I'm not seeing you. I think you have to turn around. Ah, there I go. Nice. You. So tell me. All about the BP Renegades and this 50-year relationship you all have built. Sure. So, um, hi, everybody. Uh, good what is it, morning. Um, so, Maria, thanks so much for inviting me to um, be a part of, of this. Um, so, basically, um, as it says, you know, I'm president of BP Renegades. And, of course, um, we've had one of the longest running um, and I would say most successful uh, sponsor relationships um, in the, the steel plant industry. And, of course, it's with... Um, our corporate sponsors, BPTT. You know, um, 50, this is the 50th anniversary, as you would have mentioned, and um, many people would have been wondering, you know, how, what would have happened 50 years ago to get to this point. So as we know, um, when the steel pan industry and fraternity would have started getting going, there were a lot of fights and stuff that was happening. And um, the government would have been inviting um, various corporate bodies to sponsor steel bands as a means of um, stopping the violence so basically you would get corporate sponsorship which would help of course the band pay for instruments and uniforms and to buy a panyard and different stuff like that and um, in return if you fought or were involved in violence you run the risk of losing your sponsor right so that basically got the bands to behave themselves um, as we know the names of a lot of the bands were the invaders and the renegades and the desperados and, and, and those things they were all about um, aggression and you know who's the the which band had the, the more fierce fighters and stuff like that For sure. um, and then enter the picture of renegades um who back then it was no secret they were they were fighters um they were lawbreakers um that's one of the nicknames they had um but they were not actually they were actually not the best band they were actually the band was actually a pretty horrible band. It was a horror. It was it would have been a very tough choice for someone because um, the mu the musicianship and stuff wasn't the greatest. They had horrible instruments. Like it really wasn't um, the best choice. So um, the prime minister at the time, which is Dr. Eric Williams, uh, he invited um, a Moco oil company back then, which um, they were now coming into Trinidad, and he pitched the idea to them, and they said, "Great, of course we would love to contribute to community development." So. That's, I guess, something that's important to note is that a lot of these sponsorship relationships that exist in Silvan are based on the notion of community development um, and based on the, the idea of what are, not, it's not just about funding your operations, but how does this corporate entity's involvement with the organization create that relationship that allows the, the members to, to grow, the community to grow and to flourish and to thrive. So a lot of large companies Companies have invested in that because they've seen, of course, most communities around the country would have steel plants, and it became this hub of, of socialization and, and um, extracurricular activity and, and positive energy. So back then, 50 years ago, uh, the guys went into the meeting. Amoko agreed to sponsor Renegades. Um, and then, um, strangely enough, another funny fact is that um, it wasn't, Amoko was not the ones who asked to name the band or to attach the name to the band as a Moko Renegade. So it was that um, they were fine with being a, a silent partner sponsoring in the background. Um, 
and working with the members. And it was the team at the time. And I mean, remember back then, it's what we would call bajans and stuff as who's going to these meetings, right? So, yes. um, gold team, gold face, and you know, different names that are the members who were in the organization. And mm -hmm. uh, they were the ones who suggested to Lomoko, they said, you know what, it will be a sense of pride for us to attach your name to our name so that, you know, we have this multinational brand, you know, we can pull our head up high knowing that, yes, we're from the hub and, and the quarry and stuff. But, you know, that we have this big, recognized international company name attached to ours would give us a sense of pride. And that's where, that's why, how it became the, the Amoco Renegades. And uh, in, in addition to that, another funny fact is that uh, Renegades was actually sponsored by Amoco before the company actually started operations here in Trinidad. Look at uh, that. Yeah, that they, Amoco wasn't yet officially operating in Trinidad when they agreed to sponsor Renegades and they signed on. They started the next year. So, um, and of course, over the years, the relationship with Amoko, of course, and then it became, the, the brand's colors became the, the blue and red, synonymous with the sponsor, and then the canopies started painting, and then, of course, the, the logos on the pants and all of this stuff, because, again, for the members back then, it was a sense of pride to know that this large multinational company would, would see value in this sort of grassroots development with these guys, and they wouldn't really know what they're doing, but, you know, they go with it every, every day and see where, where it could go. And, uh, of course, it then evolved into BP or Moco, and then eventually um, just BP. And, as of course, as the brand changed, uh, so did our brand colors. So people actually call us the green machine now because uh, for many years we've been green and yellow. And uh, even on, on that is something important to note as a sponsor relationship is you know, how you represent the, uh, the sponsor, you know, what types of um, – collaborative things you all do how, uh, how is their brand living through your brand because it's not um, i think you mentioned before it's not it's not philanthropy you know no. it's a it's a business relationship mm -hmm. and a lot of times i found um switching my hat to my uh digital hat so as the head of public relations at digital actually before this this official title i was the um uh, I was in charge, I, I, but I still am. I'm in charge of sponsorships, communications, and sponsorship. Yes. So uh, I actually was the uh, communications events and um, sponsorship executive for for Digicel. So I actually was the person who decided on all of the company sponsorships in TNT. And uh, take notes, uh, everyone of Colin Green. <laughs> yeah. And uh, strangely enough, a lot, and I'm just going back to what Mariella would have presented a little while ago. A lot mm -hmm. of uh, organizations come to to us um without a very clear understanding of what we stand for the type of things we have for what is our corporate brand what are we hoping to accomplish and to properly align themselves with this is how you can use this steel band to do that and similarly um a lot of them just come from the 10 proposals that would just basically just ask for money or without properly you know uh, it's like a contract, and as you know, there would be an offer and an, an acceptance. Sorry, but you know, what are you bringing to the table? What would you? What can you offer? And then, what would you like in return for this? Because it's a business proposition, so That's you right. have to say, well, as a band, we are this. This is our brand. We are functional. We do these activities. This is what we can offer you. Whether and, and even um, something that might be intangible in terms of a, as an offer is that many companies have a mandate to satisfy some sort of corporate social responsibility, um, engagement or contribution to things like the arts and culture. Mm -hmm. So many organizations are, are open-minded in that regard of saying, you know, oh, yeah, we are supposed to do some sort of community development activity. I know recently, Sajiko, for instance, they adopted um, a steel band in, I think it's Barbados, one of those countries. And... Um, it's the same philosophy that they were like, oh, we need to do something to reach the community level. And they were like, you know, a steel band is a great option. You know, they have, they, they're really grassroots. It's, it's down in the trenches of where people live and, and all the people in the community come out. And, um, oh. and when you think back to, again, let's look back at the Renegades example now. When the entire community is there wearing T-shirts with BP's logo on it, waving a BP flag on the stage, walking around it, it localizes the brand and it humanizes it and changes it into an, an acceptable part of what people are doing every day. Exactly. You know, so people begin to live the brand and that's how the relationships build, which of course benefit the company in the, um, in the future. For sure. So, um, what are the questions you got? 
Um, I'm seeing a pretty um, straightforward question on a picture is important for your proposal. Well, I would say yes, but let's not get too carried away. It's not an album that you're going to be submitting. If you want to show me what your barn looks like, great. If you want to show me the condition of the panyard, example, if you're looking for a sponsorship towards refurbishing the facilities, yes. But again, let's not get carried away. The main needs of your um, sponsorship letter is to introduce who you are what your ask is and how you can benefit your sponsor in return. All right. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. that, that's a good point. Um, I, of course, at Digicel, I literally received thousands of proposals. Yes. And um, the reality is that a sponsorship manager like myself, we don't specifically have a lot of time because sponsorship is not, it's a part of what we do. So most mm -hmm. sponsorships at, at, at companies are managed by corporate communications or marketing or something but it's very rare to find one person on their entire job alone as sponsorship it's always kind of like sponsorship and this this that 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 so people would not necessarily want to sit there and as mariella said nobody has time to read three or 25 pages no um, some of the largest festivals you could think of in tnt big huge festivals including something like carry festa they would literally condense the entire festival into a five-page document or, or max width. And think about how many layers, because you just have to be very succinct and say, okay, you have to understand your brand and understand, okay, this is what we are, this is what we can offer, this is where we are right now, and this is where we want to be, and this is how you can help or be a part of that. Um, so in terms of the, the pictures, of course, it might help um, add a face to the organization. So as, uh, as Mario just said, you know, um, it also sometimes helps in the monotony of just reading black and white text proposals. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there are some proposals that when you get a proposal with nice graphics, uh, it might, it's not standard more than the one that's just a, a black and white print. Uh, but however, it's how you present the information. Very exactly. succinct, very to the point. We love bullet points. Ooh, that makes yeah. it Bullet points and very clear headings about us what we what we are intending to do who what when why how and and that's also important many people in their actual proposal and and defining it don't actually necessarily properly define their project or the band you know what is your age demographic what are you like who are you appealing to why are you doing this how is it supposed to have an impact or benefit what are the expected outcomes how will it be measured like companies don't just necessarily like give away money because they have it's like okay we also have to account to our, our board and, and the owners or whatever about how we spend their money exactly so, you have to be so specific you can't just say i need fifty five thousand dollars well why and what are you going to do with it yeah um let me ask a question so martin how involved would the sponsor be in the image of the silver artist very important very um that's a great question and um, very, very involved um, from the two levels that I've been at at BP, um, Renegades and Alexel. We are very much, um, very, very much involved because you remember sponsoring an artist or a band is an extension of your corporate brand. So we are very specific at Renegades, for instance, what, how we use BP's logo, what it can and cannot do, how are the brand colors used. We have very specific brand guidelines in terms of where the logo goes. Um, it's always on the jersey sleeve. It's always like they're very specific things that you, if you look for it, you would see it all the time. Um, we have very specific things in terms of what the yard looks like, how the player should be presented, in terms of types of uniforms that they're allowed to wear. Because that idea of imaging, remember, it's all about that. The, the main idea behind sponsorship is that a company wants to associate their brand with you. I mean, again, it's not philanthropy. This exactly. is a business relationship. So mm -hmm. when the company wants to associate their brand with you, it's as a direct result of that image. It's like, we want, we like what we're seeing or the potential of what it can be. And we want our brand associated with that. That's a, that's a frame there, that's an, an exactly. image. Colin, this reminds me, like, you know, a lot of us are, you know, religious and turned out of one denomination or another. Mm -hmm. I was beaten to our head, what your right hand gives, the left hand must say no. Well, mm -hmm. sponsorship is the exact opposite. We want everybody in the whole world to know that we have sponsored you. Yep. So it's definitely not charity. 
because that's how people get their value out of it. So um, again, it comes back to when uh, corporate sponsors, and I, and I guess it also comes down to the objectives. So companies would know, for instance, like let's go back to the Amoco sponsoring Renegades example. Mm -hmm. They know it's a bunch of bargains. They know it's uh, eSport of Spain community and the challenges that, in, that existed at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but in their mind, the image that they wanted was to show that we are helping in the community development or the development okay. of this area, these people. So for them, they, of course, would have accepted that, okay, we would have certain challenges to deal with in terms of moving this audience from where they currently are to where they can be a more favorable position. And what they've done in, in that regard is BP has invested so much into the human aspect of the band. So at Renegades, it's no secret that there are tons of um, training opportunities that have happened over the year from management workshops, personal development, um, education, bursaries and scholarships, um, all of these things because, of course, as they develop the human um, resources within the organization on the band members, it elevates the status, it elevates the image, it elevates, you know, they start seeing more positive and productive things coming out of, of the band. So uh, Renegades is a great example of, of, of that in terms of how much the sponsor would say, okay, this is the image that we want and we have to make sure the facilities are always clean. We have to make sure that, you know, whenever you print t-shirts, you have to approve the print. Whenever you're painting the racks, you want to approve the, the design and the, and the look at, and, and we collaborate. So we collaborate on all our ads, all our press, all of our panel. If you've ever been to our panel, it's, it's, the entire panel is hand painted with a mural. We have billboards all around with different branding and stuff. But all so those things. A relationship that keeps yeah. symbiotic. You'll keep exchanging ideas, keep collaborating. So it's not just like top down where you just get like a list of instructions on how to spend this money. Not at all. Yep. It's a relationship. I uh, see Martin has another question. In the case, in a case like Digicel, would there be a need for product placement in the content created by a band or artist? Sometimes. Um, it's not always deliberate or overt. Um, so, for instance, um, we've been doing a lot of work with Joshua Regrello. Um, mm -hmm. He's a really great guy. Yeah? Um, and in a lot of his videos, there's a literal huge digital sticker on the front of his pan. You swear his pan is red, actually. The whole front of the pan is a big digital. Um, and converse, um, similar to that, or opposite to that, um, we also have many um, artists and people that we work with that. If you look at it, you would never see our logo or anything placed on anything they're doing. Um, but we do, for so example, uh, part of, of Digicel's uh, ambassador contract. So we have nine brand ambassadors. Um, right. Soka Stars. So we have Nadia Batson, Nessa Preppy, Nyla Blackman, Swappy, Voice. All these are official Digicel signed brand ambassadors. Mm -hmm. They all wear a lot of red. We never told them they have to wear a full red outfit every time they perform. But a part of their contract is wear as much red as you think you can. Yes, agreed. So, so I have a question for you, Colin. What is the best time to approach, you would say, corporate Trinidad for ooh, sponsorship? That's a for us million dollar question. For me in governments, try and approach us July, August, September, which is before the new budget year when we have to do our planning. If you come off to October, our money is already allocated for our projects. I feel like I need to give you a, a, the gold star for that question. <laughs> One of the main reasons that I've noted over the years why so many sponsorship proposals that have been rejected is timely, timeliness or lack of timeliness. Mm -hmm. People send proposals way too late for them to be properly considered. Again, the company is doing a lot of things. The company is not just sitting down waiting to sponsor your event. So when you send a proposal this weekend for an event next weekend, it's like, oh, that's not happening. I remember literally looking at someone and being like, oh, that's definitely not happening. <laughs> but not even get it. It's, it's just, it's too short. Because, for instance, think about the processes that have to go in. If there's a financial part of the sponsorship agreement, that's money that has to be found in a budget, allocated, signed mm -hmm. off on, a contract has to be generated. Before the contract, there's a briefing for the contract. The legal team will have to now take days or weeks to draft such going through all of the various elements of the contract, while it's happening to generate a PO for the bill as a whole next process in itself. 
um, registering the, the person as a vendor so that they can actually do business with the companies and export, get all the financial documents, getting all like the process just does it just does not support this week for next week or this week for two weeks. It takes a while, and, and as Marilyn said, it also allows the, the company to build your activity, your barn, your event properly into the calendar of activities that we have coming up. So I can tell you, Freddie, I know exactly what Digital is doing for this November, December, January. Like, we, we generally try to think, like, three, four months ahead. So um, we would typically say if you... And, and on the flip side, because we're not government, so you guys do, like, one overall budget. We The way we budget is we would budget annually. Yes, our financial year is from um, ends March 31st, so we, our financial year runs from April. Um, we would budget for the year, yes. Um, but, of course, we would factor in things like we know, okay, Carnival, we have historical reference. So this is how much we could spend on Carnival. This is how much we might want to spend for Christmas. This is how much we might want to spend for CPL. And we do it like in buckets like that. And then we try to filter it down a lot more. So we might say, okay, in Carnival this year, we have to do mass, pan, calypso, blah, 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 events. Or, uh, so events-wise, okay, we have relationships. And as Mariel, you rightfully said earlier, relationships are like gold. Mm -hmm. Why? If I already know who you are, I know you're not a smart man or a smart woman. I know you're not a con artist. I know you're not going to take money and not do the activity because that is a, a key reason why companies now require you to execute your event before they release the funds a lot of times. That's a mandate by us. If you come to Digicel for us to fund your project, that is not happening. Um, mm -hmm. Because our job is not to fund your project. What we are doing is buying the opportunity for us to have our brand associated with your project. You have to figure out how to fund your project on your own. The sponsorship money is not for that. For, and that's our mandate. So, whereas you send us this great big budget or all these things and then you need the money and then your event is in four weeks but you need the money now because you have to pay for the lights man and the truck man and the screen and the, the tents, that's not our problem. No. We're going to be like, that's just not our problem. Thank yeah. you. We actually have a policy where we don't pay money before the activity happens. And why? In the past, people would have gotten deposits, 50% off X, Y, and Z. And what happens is that the event never happens and you can't get back the money, they disappear. Uh, they tell you, well, you have the money already spent, I can't do nothing for that. So part of our sponsorship policy is we don't give up, for, like we don't do deposit down payment. We sign a contract with you or mm -hmm. an, an MOU. And we roll from there, you get a PO, and, and after that, you then wait 45 days or whatever, and then your payment is made. So you really have to be able to fund your project. So I would say but us generally, three months is a safe period, especially if you say, okay, uh, so three months between what, November, December, January. Yeah, so if you say in February, you want to do this, we can play, okay, cool, we can have that discussion. Because think about it, right now we're in November, but we are focusing solely as a brand and cash. That, that's just not going to happen. So generally, what we will try to do is say, when as a proposal three months before, so that we can do what we're doing over the next immediate six weeks, whilst kind of thinking down the road of, okay, this is coming up next. We can factor this in. Oh, Republic is coming up. We can have this. Oh, look, we got a proposal to do this. That's not a bad idea. Um, so that's the kind of time frame. We're not as, as, as rigid as government. That would require you to do it July, June, or whatever. But mm -hmm. we just kind of need... I would say minimum in a last case, worst case scenario, six weeks as a worst case scenario. Like if you're going to send a proposal less than six weeks for your event, you had a, you have to come real good, or you have to literally know somebody to pick up the phone and say, "Hey, I'm now sending you a proposal for this. Look at it for me now," because after that you just get lost in the, in the clutter sometimes. For sure. So we have a question from Mahalia, who's actually one of our spotlight artists, mm -hmm. and she's our first instrumentalist. Mahalia is a panist. Hey, so she's asking, what is it? Oh, actually, it's not Mahalia, but hi. Marty wants to know. Um, I just saw a question. Yeah, Mahalia, just have a question. Mahalia, yeah. I think Mahalia needs a question. I think it has something to do with Panis and what yeah, I Yeah, I saw advice and I didn't get to read yeah. the whole question. Okay. Yeah, so. Uh, Guys, keep the questions coming, huh? It's, you're asking some really cool stuff. Yeah. Um, but, but Mario, that was a good question in terms of the, the timing. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing as well, guys, that I want to touch on is also the expectations. Um, yeah. A lot of times, 
the expectations between sponsor and, and relationships. So it's one managing expectations and managing the relationship. Mm -hmm. If you say you are going to give a sponsor this pen, give them this pen. You can't expect us to be going to tell a sponsor, I'm going to give you this, 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 this. And then on the date, well, you know, we didn't get through what this, and we didn't print the banner again. So it happens. So company sign says, okay, we'll sponsor this activity. We want our logo on the banner and on the stage backdrop. On the day of the, on the event, there's no banner, there's no stage backdrop. And then you hear, well, you know, we didn't get the money to print the banner, or we didn't get this to finish that. So, and it's kind of like, well, yeah, then you renege on your sponsorship agreement because that's what we agreed to. Yes. So things like that. Um, similarly, for for like larger productions and events and stuff, when people get into a lot of the bigger acts, where you you tell the sponsor, okay, I'm going to give you ten complimentary tickets, five parking passes. Um, VIP access for two executives, um, free food and drinks on the VIP deck. Um, your logo will have 25% um, in terms of size ratio to the, the other sponsors. You'll have lead placement. You'll, you'll appear on the screen once every every eight minutes. And people are very like specific with their what yeah. they deliver. As well. So they say uh, a 10 second logo animation will appear intermittently throughout the night at least 50 times through the night or like all those different things when you have a list of things you promise you just need to deliver on it like you need to really say okay get someone to manage all of those things if you know you have to be for example um i remember one of the time we did an event uh at digital and what happened was um we were supposed to be the exclusive network and then i roll up in there and i'm seeing a a, a, a competitor's flag <laughs> and i was like i was like you know you're not getting paid it's like that's it. It's a total breach of contract. I was like, yeah. Even though we had branded up all over the event or whatever, like that's not that's your problem. No, that's not my problem. It was not what it was agreed on. Yeah. Yeah, and similarly, and you would get this issue a lot with things like um, with uh, drink companies. So, for instance, if you have blue water, it's most likely going to attain exclusivity deal. You can't have crystal water in the bar. Mm -hmm. And it happens, and I know sometimes we overlook these things. So, FYI, for instance, for 2020, um, Blue Waters is the official rehydration partner of BP Renegades. Um, and, Blue Waters? Yeah, and people were surprised because people assume that because we are BP Renegades that we can't get other sponsors. But the idea is, is that you have so many categories of things you can assign to people. So, let's say you come at Digicel. Digicel can be the official telecoms network of your band. Blue Waters can be the official rehydration partner. Car could be the official bear. This one can be, and you can literally take your one band and break it up into so many different levels instead of going the route of title sponsor. Because that I is what entrepreneurism right there. Added income revenue support streams. Yeah, because I know in Pan in particular, there's this glorified notion that everybody wants a big corporate logo attached to their band. Because we see it and it's like it's an aspiration and you want to have a big name in front. I've, I've known steel band to literally took next to nothing from companies because they wanted the prominence of having the brand's logo and i'm saying well no nah, that's not happening i was like if they're not paying for that if you're not getting substantial amount of money whether it be hundreds of thousands of dollars even to the million dollar mark and onward then you should not be doing that i was like you could sell them however the opportunity to put their logo on this. And a good example who did a lot of that before was Exodus. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you remember the days before Exodus was like officially um, Republic Bank or Sajiko and stuff. That I'm only were... 16. I'm not old enough to remember these things. Yeah. But um, at Carnival time, you would have seen Exodus. They would have one rack with KFC, one rack with this next brand, one rack with this next brand. And they literally sold their entire band to multiple sponsors. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was before and i figured it was of of course i guess because the cost of having one person become exclusive x brand band is so expensive that it's easier for me to tell 20 companies hey give me ten thousand dollars each and i'll put your logo on the racks and you'll get a sign over the rack and and what aims with an exodus did back then was they made it very cute so because all, all these signs were glittered so it's a black backdrop and your logo with glitter dust and it looked like a you know deco kind of thing yeah. um this is asking one company to hey, give me a million dollars to name the band republic bank exodus or whatever whatever it is you know um, so i thought they were a good example of that um sorry i saw my question came back up yes 
What tips would you give to partners like myself to be a brand ambassador for companies? Or what info you think will stand out when asking to be an ambassador? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, Mahalia, truthfully, what happens here is Generally, panis and steel bands need to start viewing themselves like actual artists. And I don't mean artists in the realm of go on stage and perform, but I mean all of the other things that come with being an artist. So think about global artists. When you think about the names that you know, think about a, a Beyonce, a Bruno Mars, or even a local, a Destra, a Marshall Montano. What... What are the elements of their brand that then make them attractive to a corporate sponsor? Apart from the fact that they can sing and they have a nice song. Um, and that is where I think a lot of partners in particular fall down. What is your unique selling point? What are you bringing to the table? Where are your professional photos? Where are, your, like, where are all of those things? Where, what is your brand? Because yeah. unless you establish what your brand is, then what is the person really buying into? So, for instance, I'm using the example of like a Joshua Regrello. Why Joshua became so attractive to Digicellers? When you look at Joshua Regrello's brand, you can tell exactly what Joshua is a very happy go lucky, extremely exuberant person when he's behind that part. It's the facial expressions, is all the quirkiness. Um, mm -hmm. And when you look at the results of that, people tend to, oh, they like him, he gets favorable thing from the from the public. But What's also important is that Joshua is an active marketer of his brand. So yeah. before even being a Digicel, working with Digicel, you would have seen Joshua doing covers of so many songs and putting it out there. Um, he's, he would have always been recording something. You would see these random photo shoots of him with a pan on, on, in Karani Swamp or on San Fernando Hill or, or different places like that, um, that... You know, at, at the end of the day, many um, panists don't do that. So, for instance, if I was to say, okay, guys, Digital is looking for a brand ambassador. No, you have 10 minutes. Send me your portfolio. What am I going to get? Or if I say, send me professional, your professional photos. What am I going to get? Therefore, back to somebody mentioned about imaging earlier. What is the brand going to associate with image at? Think about all of our brand ambassadors. Go to any of their social media pages and stuff you will see a, a prominence of great pictures, glam. It's entertainment, it's showbiz. Uh, yeah. You would see a lot of things like that. Um, stage things outside, activities you're doing, recordings, covers, um, a social media presence. What does your Instagram page look like? What is it saying? What does your Facebook page look like? What is it saying? Those things are free. Like you don't have to pay to have an Instagram account. You just yeah. have to make sure that you have good content on it. Everybody has one of these now. Everybody has a phone. Like, you have to make sure that you use these tools that are available to you to establish your brand and build your brand that your brand is or becomes attractive to people. And I mean, that's just part of it. Of course, there's the talent. Realistically, if, you're, if you don't have, if you're not that talented, you have a challenge. So, of course, you have the, the talent that's there. Practice your craft. Be able to, to, to do the rehearsals. Come out and show that, yo, I can play well. My stuff sounds good. People like it. That's just part of the battle. So it's a whole combination of things. What um, I have noted is that uh, many people, I'm going to say this as a blanket statement, and I play pan as well, by the way, people. So for those who may not think that I'm talking, I, I, you can I, teach me because I'm still trying to learn. No, I play pan um, before becoming president at BP Renegades. I actually, mm -hmm. um, I, play, I played with the band for 11 years, and then before that, I was with um, uh, Shell Invaders. And, uh, so I play for, I've, I've been around, right? Tours and different stuff. Trinidadians, I'm going to put, apart from pan people at a particular time of the year, overall, Trinidadians don't like to practice. They don't like to rehearse. They don't like to practice. Mm -hmm. The challenge there is that practice makes better. It, I wouldn't say perfect, but practice makes better. You have to practice to get better. All of the in, all the Beyonce Beyonce is Beyonce still does vocal training. All of the Rihanna Rihanna is Rihanna still does vocal training. Correct. How many local artists can we say actively does vocal training to improve their craft? And okay, they have downtime and they beating it, saying, "Okay, I'm practicing, I'm practicing, I'm practicing till I'm tired." When you look at um those big concerts that people put on um a couple two years ago, BP Renegades, we did one called Beyond Horizons. 
-hmm. the band practiced four months like literally it was about six months to stage that show or seven months of, of practice before that show was staged because of the level that we wanted to stage it at similarly things like super bowl after which are these huge shows that you watch people go at these artists rehearse for months and months and months on end every it's single day night to be able to perform that 13 minutes or that eight minute show that we see and we love so much mm -hmm. we don't like to do that we reach late for practice we want to leave early we want to lie and for me it cuts us short in terms of how far we can get to if we really just tighten up a lot more. So for me, it's a matter of getting the talent, making sure that the brand is there, making sure that you, you are the best possible vision of yourself, and then add any markets and things onto that. Get online, get a website, get a social media presence, get a Facebook page, get an Instagram page, build an audience, build a fan base. Because when you sell your brand, and I'm using the word sell, when you sell your brand to a corporate sponsor, the sponsor's buying into all of that. They're buying into holistically your, what I call your community. Once upon a time, it was the community of the sponsor, the band, because it's in this neighborhood and they want you people in the neighborhood. But now your community is like online. It's your fans, it's your supporters, it's your family and friends. So you need to get all of these people to support your brand, like your stuff, post on Facebook, share it to their friends, tag their friends, so that you start popping up on people's radar. And when you start doing stuff like that, you'll be surprised at how, how people then start approaching you to say, hey, Mahalia, We've seen you popping up this. We saw your Beyonce cover. We saw your Marshall Montano cover. We saw your whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, we want you to do something for us. Or we want to put you in an ad or in a campaign or X, Y, and Z. But if, as an artist, you're not as out there as possible, then what is a company really buying into? Exactly. Yeah. That's, um, that's key. I think they really need to treat themselves as a business and look to build their online communities. Especially, I mean, Colin, we don't even have a carnival next year. Yeah. So for me, it's like more than ever, you have such a fantastic opportunity to do all of these things. So the, the competitive advantage that a lot of bands and groups and companies had, and when I mean competitive advantage, I mean it's tough as a small band to compete against a BP Renegades, just because of the resources that we have and we've built over the years. Mm -hmm. I mean, the band is 72 years old. We've had a, we have a lot of resources. We have a lot of the best instruments, tuners, arrangers, all of this, all music, instruments, art, uh, musicians that are, that are formally trained. We have a music academy. It's tough. But now, in this realm of like, all those things don't matter. The fact that we have a big panyard, it doesn't matter because everybody can't come to it anyway. What matters now is that everybody has this. You have a computer, you have a phone, you have a video, you have an internet connection. Now it's a time when a lot of people could be making inroads into building their brand and establishing themselves and becoming recognized because let's face it, everybody's just glued to their TVs, they've glued to their computers, glued to Facebook, glued to Instagram, because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> like you can't go anywhere. And, you know, sure. as you said, like, you know, we're online. So, you know, your sponsorship may not just be tied to Trinidad and Tobago. You exactly. Might be somebody else in Japan that wants to come and sponsor a local Trinidad and Tobago steel band. You don't know. Yeah. So, and that's very right. So recently, yeah. um, there were all these online bonds and virtual carnivals. So not Hill Carnival, the online show, Miami Carnival. And did you sell sponsored some of those? Because we felt the same thing. We were like, well, hey. Now, look, we, from Trinidad, we could sit down and sponsor Notting Hill Carnival yeah. um, and get a whole big European audience. And, I mean, it works that way. We don't have to send branding across. We don't have to send signage. All we have to do is give them a logo and they stick it up on the screen. Yep. So, you're right. It, 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 adds, it expands your ability to get so many more people. But going back to a couple of steps back, you just have to create content. You're selling something. The brand is, yes, it's you, but it's also you and what you do. So... Is the person buying into the other cut? So look at uh, Nevin mm -hmm. and the uh, panorama. Classic example. I mean, he is not a, a, a huge, um, he's not a band. He's no. not a, a thing. He's an individual that had a great idea and then got people to buy into the idea, used the social media in a really great and contemporary way, got other people to participate online and virtually. And that just grew into this really big deal. And he was like a to me like a, one of those overnight sensations where one day you kind of say, Okay, I might have heard of him. I know I know him on Facebook. And the next day it was like everywhere. Everybody was talking about it. Yes. These are all the opportunities that you guys have. 
Um, Curtis, Marcel, Milton, why also did that with Funkler back in the day? We went there. Oh, but the sponsorship, right, was yeah. a marketing manager. Right, so some companies, for instance, um, Curtis, that's a good point. Some companies would, um, would be very specific and even rival their own brand. So as you said, um, when you when, when Fonclair did that and you were never allowed to bring Karim um, because you all were doing, he was doing stuff with Stag. It's, mm -hmm. it's very specific. Where we are, did you sell? I don't want to hear anything about any other network. I don't even want, it's so bad. Like the funny thing here is that if you send me a sponsor proposal or you give me a call about sponsorship at Digicel and you call me from a number that, well, now we have number portability, so it's different. But, and you call me from a number from the other network, I'll be like, wow, you know, you should really try getting a Digicel number. <laughs> um, and it's that same thing is that you, and it's little things, you have a sponsorship meeting with Blue Waters and you have a, uh, and then you, and you meet and somebody asks for a glass of water and then you crack your bottle of Crystal or Oasis and you pour it into a glass. That's that's not good. That's bad. That's horrible. Right. That's and like, go away to Mori, t shirts to anti cancer, you know. Ex yeah. <laughs> and, and stuff like that. So, yeah. So, that, that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, so, let's see. What else you guys want to know? We touched on the branding. We touched on the. Oh, um, another thing that I feel we can mention, uh, Mariella, is sure. that the opportunities that sponsors are looking for for, uh, for actual growth and to help people. Um, Sponsorship does not only have to be asking people for a lot of money. No, it's sustainability. That it can be enough. even asking a sponsor to help in terms of you have, for example, there are all these finance companies out there from the corporate banks, the insurance companies. So RBL, RBTT, Scotiabank, Free Citizens, dot, dot, GMMB. dot. Um, GMMB, Sagicor, um, Guardian Group, blah, blah, <laughs> the full gambit of them. Mm -hmm. Let's say, for instance, you were looking, you could get one of those companies to sponsor a financial literacy program for your members. Mm -hmm. Think about one, how valuable that would be to the band and the band's future development, um, and also in terms of helping the band achieve its financial goals in the future. Um, and two, okay. think about how accessible and how much that makes sense for one of these companies to do because it's aligned to their core business. Um, That's great. So, so something that, like... Yeah. That reminds me. So when I was at UTT, I actually ran a pilot program with Central Bank of Toronto Vigo called the National Financial Literacy Program. Mm -hmm. so what do you do? They go to schools, and then we identified in La So there's actually um, like classes for teenagers or adolescents who are pregnant, and they tweaked it for them. So you know, this is like something you could look at CBTT for doing for your steel pan industry too. So very mm -hmm. good point, Colin. Yeah. Um so, and similarly, again, you might go to um, a metal works factory to ask them to help, you know, what you, you might have some welding to do on your partner. Actually, you might say, hey, you know, instead of getting the money from a sponsor to buy, blah, 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 go to these companies that are doing fabrication and welding and ask them to either sponsor the service of getting the welders to repair the racks or X, Y, and Z. And then, and in return for that, you offer them, you know, we would give you the visibility and the mileage, you know, we'll make it very public that you all helped us. Because, of course, companies want to get their, their day in the sun. They want to get the credit for the things that they're invested, time and energy and resources. Mm -hmm. So don't just think of getting sponsorship as finding a, a big ton of money. Something as easy as, let's say you want to stream a proper concert. And you would say, you know, we would need internet connectivity to make that happen. You could again approach a company at Digicel and say, you know, we're going to need internet for this stream of this concert or um, the editing of the video or whatever. If, uh, you know, you all could pay. The value of that might be upward of $20,000, dollars 30000 uh, But it's easy for them to say, you know what, no problem. We can get some of our technicians to work with you. We'll get our, our video editors to work with you. You know, put our logo on the video, X, Y, and Z. What I've also done, it does is this idea of, uh, you know, like you have a the doubles man with plenty of people and you doubles man with nobody. Yep. And now when you pull up, you kind of go by the doubles man that have plenty of people just because oh, you're like, okay, it must be tasting good because everybody there. Yep. It's that same scenario. When you get different companies to sponsor in-kind services, and that's what we call those kind of things, mm -hmm. and you get them to align and have their logos and their brands involved, it then makes it like highlights the other corporate sponsors. Hey. But this company has this one, this one, this one, this one. You know, they're onto something. How come the all these big brands there? Why are we not there? Let's see what they're doing. Like, we've literally had those conversations. 
when they've had some big things happening in TNT, our team would brainstorm and we'd be like, no, we need to be in that because that's where everybody is. That's where this one, this one, this one is. Like, we need to be aligned with that. Um, and, and sometimes that's also just a, a good strategy of getting in-kind services from a bunch of people. I don't need any money, I need it to do it. So I don't need it to... Um, I don't need $50,000 to get the paint, but I need a paint company to help me by sponsoring the paint to the value of. And you give them the credits and the mileage as if it was a cash sponsorship because the reality is you're going to take the money and buy the service anyway. So mm-hmm. just get them to give you the service. Exactly. Um, Paul, and I cannot begin to tell you how much I have enjoyed listening to you <laughs> give your insights on this. And I know from my end how to direct my artists to Digicel on the time kind of timelines you're working with. Yeah. I really, really appreciate how um, you expanded on the importance of you wanting sponsorship, but you need to get your brand identity locked down tight and see how it aligns with your potential sponsor before you even begin to draft that first letter. Yeah. You, you need know, to develop yourself you know, first. Don't know you are, how you can convince somebody, you know? Yeah, because in 2020, like, it's so competitive out there. There, This is not 50 years ago when BP now came to Renegades and uh, and there was not many other options, you know? Um, now, you have so, it's so competitive that you really need to develop your brand as much as possible so that when you go out there, like you're going out there with a really clear idea of this is who I am, this is what I stand for, this is what I'm trying to accomplish, um, and this is why, this is, remember the cell, this is why you want to be associated with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of times, you know, we just need to remember that, that what we're selling is the brand association. You want to be associated with me because we have these people involved, we have and, and don't overlook anything. You just have to sometimes do, and it's only business developmental stuff that we've heard over the years, the, the various analyses. We swat mm-hmm. and he slept and he this and he that. And all these things really help, believe it or not. Like they really, really actually help. Um, because when you understand what you need to highlight, what you might need to downplay, what you need to develop on, it gives you a really good, clear sense of what you can propose and offer to someone as a sponsor. Exactly. And that's why I said, too, don't be afraid to ask for critical feedback, too, you know, because Mm -hmm. we all are human and we all have ways of improving. We all think we have the cutest baby. Pardon? I said we all think we have the cutest baby. Who said we don't? (laughs) (laughs) No, but it's true. And I honestly believe that we need to encourage pioneer practices year round. It will not only improve your technique, and position yourself better, but it will also help draw crowds when we could finally go on and engage in public. You know, so I for sure have really appreciated your time. And I want to ask you one last question before we wrap mm-hmm. up. What do you think it was key that has sustained that 50 year relationship with BP? Because I mean, a lot of bands get sponsored, mm-hmm. you know, on different sponsorships, but 50 years is longer than most marriages call it. Yeah. What's the years of- it, it's it's funny um at the in january this year i mean we had all these grand plans for 2020 and then 20, yeah and then 2020 was like huh psych not happening mm-hmm. um but in january we had a, a classical music concert and we launched our 50th anniversary year. and um, at the end that we were in my speech actually was, was mentioning a lot of the things that happened um uh be, that, that renegades relationship was longer than that B, BP and Renegades have been together before the Twin Towers were built. You know, before there was a um, Queen, before Queens all had walls, before, like, you know, it was, it's been so long. And uh, I think the biggest word there that I could sum it up is relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, generally, um, the relationship built between, well, two things. One relationship, because you all need to understand each other. We have a really great relationship with BP. Um, all of the staff, all of the um, the um, the presidents, all of the everybody who works at BP believes that they are a part of Renegades. We do multiple activities throughout the year, from um, not only on sponsor night, but whenever they have guests, we would do things. We go to meetings. We we, we brainstorm collaboratively. Um, right now, we actually have a a, a video series that's going to come out. Um, we'll just highlights of our relationship that's going to be on YouTube and stuff on Facebook that's going to air, if I think, from this week coming here. And this is after months of brainstorming, working together. We know everybody in the company and everybody knows us. And so relationship is very important. The other thing that I think is also critically important is 
this never-ending thirst and desire to for wanting more and doing better. And I don't mean necessarily wanting more from the sponsor, but I mean wanting more for yourself. Right. It's no secret that we have we are one of the more established and I guess progressive bands out there. Um, the things that we have going, like we have full time staff that are salaried and that pay NIS and all these different things. We have full time facilities and commercial entities. We have an international tour and booking agent. That's why we do so many international tours. Wow. Um, we yeah, we actually have an, a, a company called Run Productions out in the UK, and they um, they've been booking Renegades international tours for the last twenty eight years, I think. Um, so that's why we are always in some part of Europe, from ever you could think of. Um, but for us, is is that drive and that quest to never settle? So currently, right now, like last night, I was at the Panyard. Uh, if anybody here has ever been to, to BP Renegades, we have a great Panyard. Mm -hmm. um, it's very nice. The aesthetics are, are great, but we start. We've started feeling like it's it's. It was good. It was good for what it was back then. And where we are now is that we've looked at it and we're like, oh, kind of outdated. We need to upgrade. So last night we were there and we had a meeting and we we're just looking at the actual panyard and we we're like, okay, now we need to tear down this building and do it over. We need to do it two story. We need to add a da -da -da. We need to remove these bleachers and bring them back and do them with a, a cover and lights and whatever, whatever. We need to remove all of these decals and put screens there instead. Um, right. That doesn't have to happen. The average band might just be contented with what they have. But I found that by us, there's this, this never ending thirst and desire to always want to improve on what we've done before. So when we go like except shows and panorama and different things, we, we, yes, we want to go panorama to win, but we literally try to outdo ourselves from the previous year. That's right. You're competing against yourself. Yeah. So we're like, okay, how could we, like, what, what we, how can we beat what we did last year or in a concert? How can we make this even better than we did at the time before? Or the uniforms, how can we do a different uniform, a nicer uniform, or a more contemporary uniform? And, and, and as I said, this ongoing drive to continuously get better allows us to always look at things that we want to improve. So let's ensure the entire state side can read music. All right, let's get music academy. We have a full-time music tutor that teaches music to the junior band and the senior band. Let's now do this. And we just constantly do that. And because we are constantly in this drive for development, of course, the corporate sponsors love that and they support that. So it's mm -hmm. never a dull moment. There. It's never just take money and sit down. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the evolution and the combination of those things is really what has led to the longevity of, of the relationship. You know, we, we, the relation, we really have, been, we have worked pretty well together. Um, and there's a, a never ending drive to, to just do better and just keep changing and just keep evolving and, and stuff. That's great. So you all don't stand still because the world does not stand still. So if you keep doing the same thing and not looking to grow, you're going to get left behind. And yeah. I don't think that's the case for BP Renegades at all. No, and, and, not and uh, watch. <laughs> no, no, no way. And the thing is, guys, um, you see the, the notion of, of agility, being able to look and adapt and move quickly and spot trends. Because remember, with your brand, you're trying to make your brand as attractive as possible all the time. So if you realize, hey, Instagram Live's anything, you need to jump on an Instagram Live. If you realize, hey, backing up artists is anything, you need to jump on some couple popular artists. If you, and and when we um just back to when COVID started, um, COVID nineteen started in March, officially. That's when Trinidad got the lockdown, right? Yes. Uh, within I think the first two weeks or three weeks, we we launched the Beat the Pandemic concert series on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and for each week, we were getting thousands and thousands of of uh, people tuning into the shows. And then we initially started of, of it being shows with the band, and then starting to get other. Um, when we ran out of players in the band, we started extending it to other friends of the band. And then we ran out of that, and then we started extending it to mm -hmm. other bands. And we ran out of that, and then and then for seventeen weeks, I think it was consistently, we had these online virtual concerts. These things literally started two weeks, I think it was, after the lockdown was announced. Mm -hmm. And it was literally because we were there and we were like, okay, all our plans for the year so far scrapped because we were supposed to be having jazz in the panyard, a concert coming up, and that, and that. 
and we quickly pivoted and immediately said, yo, we need to jump on this and we need everybody virtual. We need to do something virtual, figure it out. Yeah. And then that was the same for us at Music TT under Melissa and Marty's watch as well. Our live music district went online. We had our lockdown quarantine series. Yeah. And and again, when you look at it, very few people manage to do that. So we have over 100 still bands in Trinidad. Why was BP Renegades the only one doing weekly virtual concerts? Exactly. And I'm like, and every week I was like, how come nobody else is picking up on this? And then late, months later, you started getting the one, the one off and then Panorama J came virtual and I was like, great, something. And then that happened and then Pan, Panorama and that happened. And then it was like, okay, could somebody else pick this up? And, and the reason why we stopped the, um, that, the pandemic series was that we actually stopped it in the August because we the, the state side was practicing because we were going to do a huge virtual concert with a full band um, for for Independence Day. Mm -hmm. So we were practicing for for uh, five weeks quietly. We didn't tell anybody what was happening. We had a set. We had choir engaged. This that screens animations. It was going to be a huge production um, that we were doing. And then the week before we actually filmed it was when the Prime Minister announced the second lockdown. And then we were no longer allowed to gather in crowds. So that idea just kind of died. And then we said, okay, cool. We're good for Republic Day. And we went again. And then we started having the production meetings virtually and stuff. And then I was like, okay, gosh, we still can't meet gather in crowds. Okay. Um, and then now, similarly, we've already started planning Carnival. So I can tell you for sure, BP Renegades is having a virtual concert for Carnival or show. Uh, with different artists already engaged, back, backed by the band, um, backup singers, horn men, all sorts of things. And my thing is, when you sit down and you don't, you're not agile and adaptable and quick and on the pulse of things, you are not attractive to a sponsor. Correct. Because the sponsor wants to be in the center of everything. And if you're yeah. not the center, forget it. Yeah. Well, does like attention. So if, you are not the thing that has the attention on you because just simply because you're not cutting edge, you're not trendy, you're not contemporary, you're not on the pulse of this is where people are right now. Then somebody else comes with a, with a proposal. Okay, this is Panama as well. Aha, yes, sir. <laughs> um, most of the management of steel orchestras want to hold on to power with their old ideas, and that's what's causing stagnancy. Renegades also has Exodus has done an exception, excellent job thus far. Yeah, and adding to that as well, Curtis, um, Another band that has done really um, that has done really well in terms of coming up with ideas has been Invaders. Mm -hmm. um, Shell Invaders, we and to my horn here, I'm also a part of that team. Why um, am I not surprised? <laughs> yeah, I know. So, for instance, um, Shell Invaders Republic Day Juve, which that Republic Day Juve last year, we clocked 9,000 people. Um, that's the largest steel band event hosted by a steel band and look at that um and when we first started it it was again an idea it was like okay what we need to be like okay we people need to find pan thing the whole tradition of pushing pan has died out la 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 and then it was for the anniversary and um there was invaders 75th anniversary i think it was and um somebody said oh it'll be so great if we could have a juve right um, you know, like a long time juve because you know, uh, people always say that invaders was a juve band, and um, out of that, it, it sounded you know, like when, as you say, shit talk, people are like just talking nonsense and it's a joke, and yeah. this one laugh, and then people say, Well, yeah, and people will be jumping up the road, and I say, Yeah, go push the pan, and I'm coming out like a like a a, a, a jamet and whatever, and, <laughs> and then of course, the people are like, You know. You have to be able to filter through all those things. I was like, wait a minute. Not a bad it's idea. It's actually sounding like something that can happen. And then um, it was Liz Nam. So she said, I think we should really do it. She said, you know, I, we should do a juve. Um, and then was the second part. Now, that's one thing. Fine, do a juve. Great. Now, for the typical steel band, the average thing would have been to do a juve carnival Sunday, Monday morning, which because that's juve. Mm -hmm. But we then said, well, no, if it's a, a, a separate product, it needs to stand out. You know, we need people to realize that carnival is too saturated. This needs to be its own event. Like we think it can happen, people would come out and have a good time. Of course, the naysayers only really feel like they can get people out at four o'clock in the morning outside a carnival to throw um, all the paint and powder and mud and push pan. 
mm-hmm. not happening. And we were like, well, it just depends on how you frame it up. So we had to find a day that would be like of relevance for people to want to come out. Of course, Independence Day is already saturated with everything. Everything from the parade to fireworks to Pan on the Avenue. All sorts of things happen on Independence Day. So we uh, said, well, Republic Day, nobody really knows what, what to do on Republic Day. True. Like there's no celebration at all on Republic Day, but you stay so. So we said, great, we found the day. Republic Day is a national day associated with the plan. Good. Make a, that's a perfect fit. And then was the whole idea of reinventing the tradition. So we said, okay, it has to have a unique selling point for it to be attractive to sponsors. Mm-hmm. Because we have so many of these pan events with these bands and trailers going down the road. And we're like, nah, that's just not attractive to sponsors anymore. It's overdone. So we decided, you know, we have to make it as interactive as possible. So we said, you know, if people are pushing the pans like always long time, you know, they end the thing. They end the mix between the bands and the pan and whatever, whatever, whatever. And we just built up that, built up that, built up that. Uh, the first year we did it, it was really supposed to be, a, it really was honestly supposed to be a one and done. <laughs> it was really just supposed to be a one-off event. It was supposed to happen once and that was it. And the first time, I think the, the fire service told us I had about 4,000 people. Mm-hmm. And uh, between three and 4,000 people. And uh, we were like, I was like, yo, this is gold. Oh, can you all not see that this is gold? Look how many people at four o'clock in the morning to come out, right? Yeah, and the band, the players had fun, mm-hmm. which was a big part of it. And But the band's management said, well, Colin, this is not our forte. We don't really want anything. To, like, we, we just can't pull. It was so much work for us to pull this together. We're not event planners like you, X, Y, and Z. You know what? You lead this team and you figure it out. And I was like, hell yes. I was like, this is gold. Of course I want to be. We, we can do this. And we was like, okay, cool. Free event. Step one. How do we get our audience? We got the audience first year. We now start taking pictures and videos and editing it properly and, um, mm-hmm. and documenting what the experience is like so that we can sell it to other people. That's so right. That's we send send the, these little short clips to sponsors and say, well, look, take a look. This is what it was last year. Look at the crowd. We got drone shots. We flew drones up in the air and had them take in all these great video shots and stuff. So that by year two, we were like, okay, good. We got more sponsors on board. But it still wasn't enough. So we were like, we need to go a step further. And we need to start to make it different. Because I was like, it can't become like one of those other party events where every year the same thing, same thing, same thing. So what we started to do was like we gave it a theme. So then we started in implementing uh, a costume theme. So it was a Hawaiian invasion or a Viking invasion um, and different stuff like that. And through doing the theme now, we were then able to go to different sponsors and say, hey, it's like a carnival band. You know, it has a theme. Instead of music trucks, we have band sides. It's mm-hmm. one whole band movement. So it's not a standard. It's not a spectator's thing. It's a participatory thing. So people are going to be in the band jumping up. So they'll be wearing your hats. They'll be wearing your bags. They'll be holding your cups. And sponsors jumped on board. So we started getting all sorts of sponsors coming on board. Um, Blue Waters, Angostura, Carib. So people got branded bags and cups and weavers and this and that. And we got the money. And then it started off in the beginning by asking the bands to play for free. And then by the last year, as in last year, we paid all the bands. So all of the bands that are paid in the juve were paid for their performance. Um, we were able to now hire security and pay security, hire pan pushers and pay those people. And all of this came from the idea of attracting sponsorship and monetizing it and developing the brand into what it became. And by last year, we were clocking 9,000 people. Look at that. Yeah, and it just came back to the idea of thinking outside the box. As pan people, I think we all need to stop doing things that we do, how we do it, simply because that is the way we do it. Exactly. We need to keep pivoting. Yeah, because that's the only way it's going to continue being interested to sponsors. If you do not keep evolving and coming up with new ideas and, and new presentations and, and, and stuff to get new audiences, you're not going to attract sponsors. For sure, for sure. Um, I mean, Colin, I think that is the most important aspect that you raised here coming down to the end of our webinar here. Mm-hmm. And I cannot thank you enough for all that you <laughs> shared here today because I, I love hearing your storytelling. I love these case studies that you've brought forth. And I think that this will have a lot of value. So for persons who have listened and you want to recommend somebody else to listen to this in your steel barn, or if you're a panist and you want to develop your craft and you want to know how to go about this, um, this webinar will actually be uploaded to Music TT's YouTube channel um, by Monday for the latest. 
So you can definitely tune in. And Colin, I just want to say thank you for your time. Anyone here listening knows that you are one of the busiest people that <laughs> in the industry, for sure. I can't believe I got a whole hour of you. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks so much for having me. It was really a, a nice discussion. And I really just hope that um, the information that we discussed really helps pe um, people who've tuned in. I would say definitely. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And you'll be hearing from me soon on my own sponsorship request. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Have a good one. You too. Take care, Colin. And all right. Bye-bye. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, please continue to tune in for the rest of our GEW events today as we unwind this week. Thank you for your time, and we hope that this has brought value to what you're doing, and we wish you all the best in your future sponsorship engagements.